Thank you for the reminder. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us for our 2022 Summer Survivor Speaker Series. Today, you will hear from Ms. Maggie First, who was born in Ostheim, Germany in 1929. In 1938, after a series of adventures that she will tell you about, her mother made arrangements for the family to escape to England by obtaining a visa for herself and rest, excuse me, and securing spots for Maggie and her brother Bert on the kinder transport, a rescue mission that allowed thousands of Jewish children to live with private English citizens. Before we begin, I would like to thank our community partners for the Summer Survivor Speaker Series. Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Lone Star, Legacy Senior Communities, and we have some members from Legacy in the audience today, so thank you for joining us. Mosaic Family Services, Refugee Services of Texas, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. We are grateful for your support of the museum and our programs. We could not do these types of programs without your help. Also, I would like to extend a special uh, welcome and thank you to our board members, members and volunteers in the audience. We couldn't fulfill our mission without you either. If you are interested in becoming a museum member or a volunteer, please visit our website, dhhrm.org, to learn more. Or feel free to pop by our uh, museum experience uh, front desk on your way out of the museum, and uh, they will be able to help you as well. I also wanted to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Jakub Nowakowski. Jakub, can you wave your hand, please? So he has joined us all the way from Poland. Um, he is a special guest here this week uh, with us. And we have a brand new special exhibit that we opened last night called Girl in the Diary about Rivka Lipschitz, a, a, a teenager who did not uh, survive much beyond the Holocaust but left a diary that was found in the ashes of one of the Auschwitz crematoria. And Jakob was a co-curator uh, on that as well. So he's joined us, as I said, from the Galicia Jewish Museum. So, so if you get a chance after, do, do uh, take the opportunity to speak uh, with him. He's a, a fountain of knowledge. Um, in just a moment, Maggie will share her story with you. Then we will have time for questions and answers. If you are joining us today in person, you can use the card that was provided to you at check-in uh, and write out your question. Our staff will come around at the end of the program to collect your cards. If you are joining us virtually, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your uh, screen to type out and submit your questions, and we will get to those as well. It is now my great pleasure to turn things over to Maggie first. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you were able to come today. Uh, my name is Maggie First, and I was born in Germany in 1929, and I am now an American Jew, and I have been for many years. Jews have lived in Germany since Roman times. In Germany, the Jewish population was well integrated by the end of the 19th century until the rise of the Nazism. Jews were part of the mainstream in Germany. Jews were professors at universities, lawyers, doctors, writers, and scientists. Many of the department stores had Jewish owners as well as the banks. Mixed marriages were common in general, the Jewish community consisted of Reformed Jews, although there were some Orthodox congregations. Our father, Alfred Romberg, was born in Diepholz, Germany, a small town not far from Essen. He was one of 13 children. His parents were Frederica and Julius Romberg, my paternal grandparents. Our mother, Sita Rothschild, was born to Katinka and Benjamin Rothschild in the village of Ostheim, Germany, not far from Mainz, of Gutenberg Bible fame, if you remember that. She was one of four children. Our dad fought for Germany in the First World War. He was the first commissioned 
Jewish officer in the German army. He was wounded and awarded the Iron Cross, the highest medal given. When he met our mother, he was a handsome young bank officer in Essen. They fell in love and married in 1927. They lived in Ostheim in our grandparents' house. He joined the family business and became part owner upon the demise of my grandfather in 1939. He took over the successful grain feed and general merchandise store, which was well known in the area. I was born in 1929, and my brother Bert was born in 1930. In 1933, after Hitler came to power, our dad was harassed endlessly by the stormtroopers who marched in front of our house and business day and night, shouting Nazi slogans, banging on the, biz on the doors and shaking the ground, causing him great distress, which eventually killed him. He had a fatal heart attack in March of 1934. At that time, I was four and a half years old and Bert was three and a half years old. Mama never got over our father's death. I found some old newspapers she had saved in which it describes the funeral cottage moving through the village. Stones and insults were thrown at the mourners. I started school in our time, and as far as I can remember, I was well treated by my fellow schoolmates. We also played behind closed doors with our neighbor's children. These same neighbors supplied us with food, milk and butter and other essentials through a common basement wall into which we had made a hole. They supported us through many trials, as they did in years past. We had a teenager named Elizabeth, whom we call Leah, who took care of us while Mama and our Oma worked in the store. Mama struggled along to keep the business afloat but as the anti-Semitic Nuremberg laws were passed, the farmers no longer felt it was necessary to pay their debts to Jews. She was forced to sell the business for pittance. They came into the store and they wanted merchandise, banged on the counter, and when she brought the material to them, they said, well, we don't have to pay you, you Jews. And they left. Well, in not, how long can that go on? In 1936, we moved to a town named Eschwege near Castle with a good sized Jewish population for moral support. My Aunt Paula lived there with her family, my mother's middle sister. We tried to overcome the adverse conditions. Mama had to take in laundry and sewing to support us. She was ordered to go to Gestapo headquarters and hand over all our valuables. You know, anything that was worth anything, they took away from us, and we kept the things that were worthless. Um, not only that, but then we had to look for an apartment. After three tries, we finally found a Jewish-owned apartment, which we had to share with another Jewish family. We were unable to attend secular schools and had to attend the one Jewish school. The trouble was we were all in one classroom, so you can imagine how much we learned. Well, I remember the things that I learned were hide and seek and the things like that. And the teachers had a hard time controlling us. There weren't too many teachers left anymore. Uh, and there was still a number of students, and we had a wonderful time doing nothing, running around. After Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht, there was no school, nor was there a synagogue left to attend. It was November the 9th, 1938. Everything that was Jewish owned was burned, destroyed, and in ruins. The houses were ransacked, Jewish men and teenagers were dragged off to newly established concentration camps. 
our cousin Henry, 14 and a half years old, was dragged off across the town square. By December the 13th, 1938, Jewish industries and shops were seized. Living conditions in Eschwege were went from bad to worse. We could not go out without being beaten up by the Hitler Youth. Now, the Hitler Youth were made up of young boys and girls, and some of them were as young as five years old. And if you don't think that a five-year-old can carry a brick, they can if they want to. And if they all gang up on one child or two children, you don't have a chance. And we couldn't lift up our hands or our uh, arms or, or defend ourselves, so we tried not to go out. Um, some of the men were eventually released from the concentration camps in terrible physical conditions. Some came home in urns. Most of them tried to leave the country as soon as possible to whomever would take them in but many had no means and no guarantor and despaired, often committing suicide. The, there was no country that was open for them. The British had a blockade in Palestine and the United States was limited because there had been a depression here. There was depression all over the world. And so the Jews were unlucky. We are convinced that Mama made a decision after Crystal Night that she could no longer risk her children's lives in Nazi Germany. Our father had a sister and her family living in Stockholm since 1928. Mama appealed to them for a visa, visa for Bert and myself. Following the Crystal Night, an appeal by Jewish committees and a debate in Parliament, the British government agreed to admit up to 10,000 children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Uh, a 50 pound bond per child was posted to guarantee their eventual fare to some other country. The British in the aid committee was established with the help of other Jewish committees in Great Britain and in Germany the Quakers were wonderful in this. The Quakers, uh, many prominent people in Great Britain. Uh, their goal was now to rescue 50,000 children. They were mostly Jewish, but there were some non-Aryan Christian children. Parliament passed an emergency measure to permit these children to enter the United Kingdom. Only two per family, and only and uh, only two per family, and they had to be party trained, alone, and under 17 years of age. They figured it would cost a minimum of 25 pounds per year to maintain each child. That was a lot of money at that time. The British people came forth and opened their hearts and homes. Only 9,354 children were actually saved, usually rounded out to 10,000. The first transport of 196 children were from a Jewish orphanage in Berlin, and that went left Germany on December the 2nd, 1938. That was barely one month since Crystal Night, so they didn't mess around. They got to work immediately. <clears throat> the last transport left with a Dutch Christian lady who was only 25 years old, and her name was Trudy Weissmiller. She faced, she faced down Eichmann in Vienna, and she brought out 600 children on one train. My brother and I received our visas to go to Sweden three days before Mama got permission from London to work in the household of her cousins, the Lowenthal's, 
who had emigrated to Great Britain in 1933. They were instrumental in getting her out and getting us onto the kinder transport. Of course, we were overjoyed. We could all be in Great Britain together. Um, the children that were taken on the kinder transports were mainly from the large cities, from Berlin and Vienna and Frankfurt and so on. So we were the exception. Of course, saying goodbye to all our relatives was very sad. Our grandmother was only 69 years old the last time we saw her, and I thought she was ancient. <laughs> and I'm almost, goodness knows how much older now. Uh, well, she went to the old age home in Frankfurt, and from there she was deported. She had always been a part of our lives, as I had all our other relatives. We were especially close to her because she mothered us when our father passed away, and she was a wonderful woman. Uh, we, we left with one small suitcase each, about the size you take onto Southwest Airlines. That's not very big. And then the little kids can't carry big suitcases anyway. The night before we left, I cleaned out my suitcase and I threw all my underwear out. Well, who needs underwear? Well, what do you think I put in there? My dolls. It's more important than underwear, right? And all the clothes we wore were made by our mother and grandmother. We had 10 marks with us, which was very little money at that time, and today it's nothing. Even in those days, it wasn't much money, and we had little else with us. The events, the scenes at the railroad station weren't very happy. Some parents held on to their children and didn't want to let them go. Others ran off without saying goodbye. Some didn't even come to the station. If you can imagine leaving a little child, and you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. Um, most of the children were not as upset as the parents. Of course not. Children don't take things that tragically. Uh, we thought it was a big adventure. We were going on a holiday. The train went forward with a lurch, and we were on our way. I can't remember too much about the train ride, except when it suddenly stopped at the Dutch border, and I heard the Gestapo boots coming into our compartment. Looking into our suitcases, they screamed at us, you Jewish dogs, do you have any diamonds now? First of all, in 1939, I doubt if there were any Jews left in Germany that still had diamonds, and they certainly wouldn't have been foolish enough to put any contraband in their children's suitcases. Uh, looking in, well, uh, besides, I doubt if there were any Jews left in Germany, like I said, that had anything. Finally, we continued on and crossed the border into Holland. The first stop we came to, there were smiling Dutch angels handing us hot chocolate and fruit that I had never seen. Well, Jews were not allowed to have any tropical fruits that they had to import, only in the things that were grown in Germany. So that was a big deal. That was the first time I had an orange, and I was almost 10 years old. Um, Okay. And besides that, nobody spat in our faces. What a feeling. The minute you got over the border, it felt like heaven. The train continued on to Hook Van Holland, the port for Rotterdam. We boarded a little ship and crossed the English Channel at night. We arrived in Harwich on the East Coast early in the morning. It was a glorious, bright, sunshiny English day, May 23rd, 1939. We were directed to another train bound for Liverpool Street Station in London. 
Mama's cousins picked us up in a beautiful new car. As soon as we were on the way, my brother Bert threw up on the cousin's wife's new shoes. That was our introduction to Great Britain. Okay, the next shock came as the uncle announced that he was bankrupt and had sold the house. But Mama could stay and work for the new owners who were due to arrive from Vienna next week. After a few weeks, Mama had a nervous breakdown. But she persevered and came through. What could she do, even if she crawled on all fours? She had no money, and she certainly couldn't go back to Germany. Well, another dilemma now. Bert and I had no lodgings. The uncle knew the president of the Coventry Synagogue. Coventry is a big industrial city in the Midlands, in, near Birmingham, between Birmingham and Warwick. Uh, and between the two of them, they found a home for 55 children. Bert was eventually sent to the Shepherds. There was mom and pop and Peter and their daughter Mary. They called him Bertie. Pop was a mailman and mom became a bus conductor at the onset of war. The Simons, where I went to live, were Jewish and better off financially than the shepherds, but treated me very shabbily. I became a cheap maid. Uh, Bert and I lived only a few blocks apart, and we went to the same school, but we saw each other only during class breaks or at Hebrew school once a week. I had to cook and clean when I came home from school, and at 10 years old, I was not very good in the kitchen. Actually, I was a terrific cook, but I was very consistent. I burnt the meat every day. <laughs> okay, to correct it, I took newspapers and put them on the floor, and I turned the pot upside down, scraped off the black, and I put the meat back in the same burnt pot. But you know what? Not knowing you can't do that. But they ate it. Now, either they had no taste buds, <laughs> or they were stupid or both. Well, in school, I was not too happy either. My English was not too swift as yet. Luckily for me, there was a Jewish teacher, a Mrs. Jacobs, who took me under her wing. The headmistress's name was Miss Smith, and try as I might, it came out as Miss Miss to the delight of the other children. They loved to hear me say Miss Miss. So I, soon I adapted to my ruined surroundings. And by the time the war broke out on September the 3rd, 1939, I spoke no more German. I wouldn't have dared. The English hated the Bosch. That was a slang expression for the Germans. And that was a hangover from the First World War. I was able to speak English in three months simply because I didn't have anybody to speak German to. I'm sure I had a heavy accent, but uh, I wouldn't have dared speak German. The Germans were the enemy. My unhappiness with the Simons family wasn't helped by the fact that I was a scapegoat for their children's misbehavior. John was two years older than I, and Esther two years younger. John teased me incessantly. Esther and I shared one bed, which she wet every night. I took my pillow and I wrapped myself in my coat and slept on the floor. English houses are, so, are cold. I don't know if you've ever been in an English house in the winter time. Don't go. Even today, they don't warm their houses the way we do. Uh, anyway, uh, it was better to sleep on a cold floor than in a wet bed. So, 
as the war progressed, the English needed factory workers. So Mama found a factory job. Now she could support herself and rented rooms with three other refugee friends. But she still did not have enough money to support Bert and myself. She took in work at night and saved extra money to dream about going to the United States. What a dream. Mama showed me a telegram she sent through the Swiss Red Cross. She had inquired about our relatives. They came back as undeliverable. I knew that she was worried, but in my childish way, I assured her the British would work hard to help everybody, and they did. They worked very, very hard. They were in that terrible war all by themselves for two years until December the 7th, 1941. Bert and I went to visit Mama whenever we had a school break, despite the fact that the bombing had started. We were so happy when we were together. When it came time to go back to Coventry, as soon as the train started to move, Bert started to cry. And I, the brave one, started to cry with him all the way back. So we kept each other company crying. Coventry was the favorite target of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. Uh, they bombed Coventry mercilessly. They were aiming for the Triumph Motor Works and the Jaguar plant, which had converted to war weapons. But instead, they destroyed the center of the city, including the centuries-old cathedral. Then they came back a week later and finished it off on December, November the 14th, 1940. There were many casualties. The destruction was devastating. All communication in and out of the city were cut, but the British kept a stiff upper lip. The Simons house was damaged the first time around, and we had evacuated to a small village near Banbury. If you remember from your nursery rhymes, those of you who are a little bit older. Uh, in the Banbury is in the vicinity of Oxford. Finally, the Red Cross were able to connect us to each other, a mother in London, a bird in a damaged house in Coventry. The conditions we were living under only made my distaste for Mr. Simon more pronounced. He was an abuser, and I was petrified, but had no escape. My writing paper, my only means of communication with my mother, and my stamps had mysteriously disappeared. I had to wait until we went to London again. Then I did not go back to the Simons. Mama went to the Bloomsbury House, that was an affiliation of Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, who were there to help the refugees. And by the way, today they help all refugees from all over the world. Um, between, the, between the hires and the Bloomsbury House, they found me a wonderful boarding school, which had been evacuated to Hertfordshire from London. But this was near Cambridge. I finally started to blossom and live like a human being. The school was situated on an estate belonging to a British colonel fighting in North Africa. He had loaned the estate to the London County Council for the duration of the war. The teachers were like mothers to us. There were 36 girls and two of us were Jewish, and two of us were from the Spanish Civil War. I was well treated and did my share. To keep the house and grounds in good shape. 
I took care of Alma the goat. Alma and I had a good relationship. We talked to each other. Although she smelled like a goat, I didn't care. I had a wonderful companion. I was happy, and now you all go home and get rid of your dogs and get yourself a goat. <laughs> They'll mow your lawn. You can, the droppings, you can use them in the garden for manure. It's, it's a wonderful, and you get milk and the best cheese you ever had. Go, go, you go to Tom Thumb and get some goat cheese and you paste it with the nose. Here you can make your own. Okay. Best of all, you won't have to pick up. That's, you, look, you know, no more lawn mowing. In the meantime, Bert was sent to a warm and loving family in Hartford, not far from where I was. Mama was afraid that he might be converted, and it was time for his bar mitzvah. He went to live with the Pettit family. They were extraordinary people. Uh, the Pettits were what I would call lower middle class, wonderful people. They didn't have much to spare, but they shared it with everybody. Uh, they were extraordinary people. Mrs. Pettit slept on the floor when our mother came to visit to get some respite from the bombing. It was, I was only able to stay in school until I was 14 and a half years old. The school was not equipped to teach people on that age, and there was a war on, and education was not the British priority. Unless you had a scholarship or money, you went to work. I returned to London and went to work for a dentist. The first day on the job, I cleaned up glass from a bomb which had fallen on the field across from the office. Every night when the sirens went off, we went to the air shelter. Well, except I didn't want to go. Nothing was going to hurt me. I thought I was immortal. One night, the ceiling came in and the windows were, flew in and I came very close to being cut very badly. After that, I was the first one in the shelter every night. <laughs> well, and we had a good time in the air raid shelter. We didn't sleep, but we told each other jokes and we laughed all night long, but we were safe. Uh, okay, on June the 5th, 1944, it was D-Day and the invasion of Europe had begun under General Dwight Eisenhower. I knew there was something going on because there were waves and waves of planes and they were all going south. Mama had started to inquire if we could go to the United States. Eventually, we did get our visas, even though the war was still on. It was a hard decision for Mama to make because of Bert's education. Bert had been awarded a scholarship to Cambridge through all the, his whole education, uh, room and board, through his PhD. Um, but she decided we would all have a better chance in the US. We left Britain with heavy hearts at the beginning of April 1945 on the old Aquitania, which had been converted to a Canadian hospital ship. We sailed from Brennock, Scotland to Halifax, Nova Scotia. From there, we traveled by train to Montreal, St. Albans, Vermont, to New York City. It was April the 12th, 1945, a day before President Roosevelt died. The war was in its final stages in Europe. Mama's sister, brother, and their families welcomed us very warmly. The British were wonderful to us. We shall always be indebted to them for their indomitable spirit, their kindness and compassion. They saved our lives and those of many others. 
No other country in the world would take in Jewish refugees. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in this world, in the world. Well, it's coming back again, and it's stronger than ever, unfortunately. Uh, a few countries made it a little bit easier, such as Chile, Costa Rica, and the Belgian Congo. Even in this country, it was hard to get in. President Roosevelt had some members in his cabinet who didn't want Jews. There was no place for them, for them to go when the Holocaust started. The greatest tragedy that ever befell the Jewish people. Some of the children that arrived on the kinder transport were picked up by various agencies and placed in hostels. The younger ones were sent to families. Some of the older ones were taken in as household help or nannies. Others were placed with loving families all over the British Isles. They went to England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Some adjusted very well. Others had a hard time being torn away from their families. The younger ones forgot their parents very quickly. Some were converted to Christianity or were adopted by families who grew to love them as much or more than their own children. As they became older, some joined the armed forces and fought valiantly. Some fell in battle. Some joined the Jewish Brigade. After the war, a few were reunited with their families or siblings, but most of the uniting was very strained and difficult. The children had not seen their parents for at least six years. The parents had unspeakable horrors to deal with. Many had psychological or mental problems and could never get used to each other again. The children had also acquired a different culture and way of life. Most of the children never saw their dear ones again. All those we left behind perished. In the summer of 1989, which is a long time ago now, there was a 50-year reunion in London, which we attended. We were addressed by many dignitaries. Amongst them was Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister. Of course, there were those countless ordinary people who gave us love and shelter. The kinder transport is but a small part of Holocaust history, but an important one. We were the ones to whom nothing happened at all, but something did happen. We were spared the horrors of the death camps. We were uprooted, transported to a different culture, and faced not the horror of the camps, but a very human mixture of kindness, indifference, occasional exploitation, and the selflessness of ordinary people faced with needy children. Many British values have stayed with us. Fair play comes to mind, and that's not cricket. We need to defend the helpless and stand our ground. Don't give in to bullies, especially the children in school. Be kind to all people. Be sure to help your parents and your grandparents. This is for the younger generation. Do some volunteer work and get used to it, to get used to a way of life. And whenever you, whenever you can, save your money and give some to the Red Cross or the American Heart Association or some other good cause. And during the summer, go and help at the food bank, which all of you can do. And make, make some sandwiches for them if you can't do anything else. Make a dozen sandwiches. Peanut butter and jelly is wonderful. Very, very nourishing. Um, there are many homeless in our community, many, many, and they all need help. Okay, and the, for the school children, 
work hard in school and get yourself a good education. That's the most important thing you can do. And I can't emphasize enough, become active in your community and for the adults too. There are many things you can do. If you only have two hours a week, you can do something. You can make telephone calls. You can do all kinds of things. And when we got to New York, I had to go back to school, and I thought I would knew everything. Well, I was 14 and a half when I went to work, and I worked hard. And I was 16 when we got to New York, and I went back to school. And I did very well in English. I didn't have to take English anymore, but I was lousy is the only word for, every, for math and science and everything else. It was completely foreign to me. So I went to Jamaica High School for a while, and then I went to Queens College at night. And I had to work. We couldn't go. I had to do everything in the evening because we had no money, and I had to go to work. And in 1948, I met my husband at the beach in Far Rockaway. And we were married in 1949. And our children were born in New York. And we came to Dallas in 1963. And unfortunately, I lost my husband 15 years ago. And I lost my son just the beginning of this year. And my daughter Robin is still here, thank goodness. And my son had two wonderful children. And I have a great granddaughter now too. And they bring me a lot of joy. And my husband was a refugee child too. But he came with his parents to New York in 1937. And he went through the New York City schools. And in 1943, he was drafted into the US Army. First, they made him a dishwasher. And then he became a medic. And then he became a translator for General Patton. And he went into Germany with, ten, with General Patton. And uh, of course, he wanted to strangle all the Germans, but being civilized, we can't do things like that. Uh, so then we settled in Dallas in 63, like I said. And I've been volunteering at the museum for about, since it's shortly after its inception, so it's got to be about 35 years now. Um, any questions for anybody? Sarah around? <laughs> Maggie, where yeah. do you think your mother found the strength to persevere through so much hardship? How I found it? No, where do you think your mother found it? My mother? Mm -hmm. God knows, really. She was amazing, just amazing. Um, she, first of all, she shielded us a lot. And our grandmother was the same way. And uh, she, she, where she found the strength, I don't know, but she did. And... Uh, she was a remarkable person. And let's follow up on that question. Where did you find the strength as a, as a child who was going into your teenage years and experiencing all of this change? I think I change? inherited from her. <laughs> you know, answer? I mean, if you want to do things, you can. Okay. And as you get older, you know that. But you have to sometimes force yourself to do things. But you know it's, know it's the right thing to do. Did your experiences before and during World War II have, a, have an effect on your faith? No, it made me stronger, I think. Well, but that is an effect. Huh? That's an effect. Yeah, well. <laughs>
No, how, it didn't have. How do you think, what do you think made it stronger for you? In, in other words, how did it affect you that way? I always felt, felt very good to be a Jew, and I always had a lot of, I don't know, something from within. It comes, it comes naturally. Okay. Um, this person wants to know, what surprised you most about the United States when you first immigrated? What surprised me most? Well, I was still only 16 years old, and but to see through the eyes of a 16-year-old, the big buildings in New York, it was overwhelming. I mean, New York was a, you know, everything about it. I mean, we had a stake on the train from Canada to the United States. I thought they killed a cow. <laughs> it was so big. I never saw a piece of meat that big before. It was amazing. Okay. Um, this this uh, audience member wants to know if your husband's family, uh, did they anticipate the atrocities uh, and the coming war, do you think, and decide to leave Germany in 37? Or were they leaving to come to the United States anyway? Uh, I think they knew because my mother-in-law came to the United States before them and got visas for the whole family. And that's the way they got out because they saw that things were getting worse. They didn't wait to, until things got better because they knew it wasn't going to get better. And so they got out early enough. Um, by the way, for, for those of you who, who have not yet uh, toured the museum, if you plan to tour today, there is a glamour shot of Miss Maggie first <laughs> up in the liberation section. So it's at the end of the Holocaust show a wing um, and she's perched like a 1945 Five or forty-six cover girl um, in a in a with beautiful long hair and her hips thrown out and kind of a smile at the camera. You've got to see that photo; it's wonderful. <laughs> I love that photo, Maggie. Um, this person wants to know if you've returned to Germany since the war. Yes, I have. Twice. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like and where <clears throat> you went. Um, yes, my husband had a cousin who survived the concentration camp. And he went back to Germany, uh, and he married a girl who wasn't Jewish, but she had a Jewish grandmother. And they raised their children in Hanover, Germany. And we went back to visit them, but I went on the condition that I go to Israel first. So we went with, from Tel Aviv, we went to Frankfurt, and the minute I put my foot on the ground, I said, close my eyes, and I said, this isn't real. And I walk in the streets, and the first impression I had is, I saw people, but I didn't see old people. So, and everybody was very nice. And I thought, oh, what am I, all the things you build up in your head, what you're gonna say, and what you're gonna do, you do exactly the opposite. And people were very nice and very cordial. Uh, but I didn't have a feeling of closeness like I do in this country when I'm in a crowd. Not until the second visit. Then I felt, well, this is really a democracy. Uh, we went to a museum and there were children that we happened to see the museum of the from Prague that was left over from the old, where they had looted, the Nazis had looted the synagogue and they had sent everything. I think it was, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, we went to see the exhibit in Germany and the teacher came in with a, with a class of German children and she was explaining everything to, to them and I was amazed what I heard she explained everything in detail and, and so lovingly that I was just floored. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, is this the country where they killed all those people? It couldn't be. Well, today it's a democracy and it's the, the best friend that the, the uh, US has. So 
Things are different. The old generation is gone. Um, this person uh, talks about um, the kinder transport, and so you were unusual in that you were your family was able to send two children. Most families could only send one. No, no, no. They were able to send two. Two. Okay. Two was the limit. Was the limit. But how did parents choose if they had more than two? Which ones to save? Which ones to send? You have any I sense don't know. of that? You know, in the old days, they used to always favor the boys for education. I don't know if they favored them for this, too. Uh, what do you do? Send the youngest ones? Send the older ones? Must, it must have been a terrible choice. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did either you or your brother stay in touch with any of your fellow students from while you were in school in England? Uh, yes, one, but one of my friends. I stayed in touch with, but she died recently. You know, I mean, we're old. <laughs> old, old, old. <laughs> okay. Um, Maggie, um, this audience member would like to know what inspires you to tell your story and then to keep telling it to people? Well, what I have been doing this for about 35 years, and I think that first of all, the younger generation, they don't even know, some of them don't even know what the Second World War was. They, either the parents don't talk about it at home, or they don't get any education in school, or they don't read the newspapers, which I'm sure they don't. Uh, so there's some place that, that has to tell them, and this is the place for it, this is the Holocaust Museum. It's a wonderful facility. There isn't anything they won't discuss, uh, anything that's related to the Holocaust or, and that era. Uh, and I think it's very important that we teach the children about this because it's happening all over again. Look at the Ukraine now and uh, all the wars they've had in the meantime since the Second World War. And we've got to take precautions that these things don't happen again. Uh, and I think that everybody should be very, very aware of what's going on. Okay. Final question, Maggie. What, if, if it could be anything, what would be the message that you would want people who, who hear you to take out into the world with them? Wow. Well... Uh, well, first of all, you have to know that every country is different. Everybody is different. We live in a multifaceted society, and we have to be very tolerant of everybody. Uh, we need to make sure that the children are well-educated because I think that everything hinges on that, that anyone that's well-educated has a different attitude than those people that are not. Uh, depends on your background, where you come from, what kind of life you live, but education is, is the key to everything. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, before, before we close, uh, I wanted to let you all know that two weeks from today, on July 29th, for those of you who uh, are in town, uh, at the same time, um, Maggie's younger brother, Bert Romberg, will be telling his story. And it's very, very interesting because they were occupying basically the same space at the same time, but they had very, very different experiences, so, so it's interesting. And I would ask you all to please put your hands together and thank Maggie for having shared her story with us. Thank you.